Hey YouTube believers, Chris Matt coming at you with Inferno number one. And I was biting at the bit to read this book. Finally was able to pick one up from one of my local comic shops. Got it home yesterday and I just was, you know, scooting in my seat thinking, man, do I want to read this, but, you know, had responsibilities. Finally got a chance to read it. And, uh, yeah. So if you guys looked at our After Dark uh, review of the trailer, which I'll make sure to leave a card somewhere up here for y'all to look at, I was really hoping that this was going to kick off with, like, a shit storm. And um, instead, it starts out very quiet. So we open up. And what I like to a degree is how it echoes the beginning of House of X. Where in the uh, House of X, you know, we saw the pods. We saw Xavier standing in the uh, pod garden. And then two people are hatched. And we see one with, but in this case, instead of seeing, you know, Cyclops, as we did in the uh, way back when, and we see Emma here standing with the helmet, and we see a bald man and a long-haired man. And you're thinking, okay, what's going on? This is kind of interesting. And then we skip past the reading, which I'm so tired of these explainer pages. And we're thinking, okay, we got X-Force. They're going up against the Orcish, Orcus, whatever it's called. The, uh, what, it, the, what the hell is it called? That space station circling the sun that houses Nimrod and how they can't seem to ever take that sucker out. You know, they sent a bunch of the main X-Men back in House of X. They failed. And then we uh, sent up Mystique in X-Men 20, no avail. And we're thinking, okay, this is going to be kick-ass. We have X-Force. And uh, as they would say, everything kind of goes foobar yet again. Now, before we continue on in the story, I want to say right now that this is spoilers. So we find out that it's a simulation. And this is the Orcish people trying to figure out why the X-Men, you know, they, they only send like maybe three at a time instead of like a whole planet of X-Men or mutants. And what I like is how um, Sentinel Prime, I can't remember her real name, sh they, they both kind of hit the nail on the head. They say, whenever it is, we're getting, uh, we are getting better at responding to them. Less than seven minutes this time. But they're not getting better at attacking us. They should be adapting, evolving, yet they don't seem to be. If they're not learning, it must be because these mutants don't know what happens after they get here. They don't remember. You're thinking, okay, that's kind of interesting to, you know, to, to kind of implement that they're kind of catching on to the resurrection protocols. Now, before we go any further, this is Jonathan Hickman. Again, as uh, it's been teased, this is Jonathan Hickman's last hurrah on X-Men. This is uh, Valero Shaiti. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Feel free to make fun of me. Artist, David Curell doing the uh, colors. VCs, Joe Sabino doing the lettering. Tom Mueller doing the design. Here's everyone else working on the book. And of course, the X-Men were created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Here we see Moira. This is her third life. If you're wondering what that means, through House of X and Powers of uh, 10, we find out that Moira is a mutant. And her mutant ability is reincarnation. Every time she dies, she comes, she's reborn. She starts as a little girl, you know, goes through her whole life, but she has the memories of her previous life. So this is her third life on Mirror Island where she wants to create a disease, a, disease, a cure for mutants and this what we're looking at here is all explained these are pages are like verbatim from house of x number two and this is where we kind of start to see the rift between destiny mystique and moira and um, destiny is just like such a gift knowledge and yet here you are using it to betray your own kind. It's a disease what we are. I'm only trying to cure people who want it. 
telling if this doesn't sound uh, topical. You think this? They think this stops at what? Uh, uh, you think this stops at want? You think they'll let you keep this thing you've made? Do you have any idea how much they hate you? The humans will come for you. They'll break you, chain you, and make you their own. And then mankind will use what you've done to eliminate our entire race. So Destiny basically gave her uh, an ultimatum of change or die in your next life. And she, and she also says, which was kind of interesting, she says, your re uh, reincarnations are not infinite. You have 10, maybe 11, if you make the right choices. So she's basically, Destiny says, in your next life, do better. And so Destiny, uh, Destiny Mystique's like, how can we uh, really solidify uh, conviction here to make her want to change? Because uh, Moira flat out says, I don't know if I can do that. So what they do is to make sure that she doesn't forget, burn her alive. And I will admit here, the artwork in the back and forth here is a hell of a lot better. You know, it's almost like verbatim panel for panel, but the artwork here just looks a lot better. If you go back and read House of X number two, the artwork doesn't look right. Now we're gonna skip over this talking monkey. And then I hate that they brought back the uh, flore the florists or whatever their name was, but they make a cameo. This is from X-Men 2. And what I hated about X-Men 2 is it's these old grannies fighting the X-Men. And it's basically a uh, LOL so random joke to the Golden Girls. I hated it. God, I tossed that issue. I hated it. Everything about it I hated. But Hickman here, you know, he, he utilizes them to talk about this technology that he sells to this uh, team. And that's as far as I'm going to go with it. You guys can read that at your convenience. Now, what I'm disappointed about, again, if you guys go watch the trailer for Inferno, or if you don't want to watch the trailer on Marvel's website, as I said on After Dark, we did a review on it. It very much teases at how everything is going to go foobar quickly. And I was hoping that that's what this book was going to kind of open with. <coughs> but I don't know if this is Ho uh, Hawkman, Hickman pacing himself. But the lack of action in this book is what kills it. There's a lot of sitting and talking and exposition dumps. That's boring. Especially for a book, an oversized book at six bucks and we get a lot of standing and talking and hearing Moira bitch. This right here goes on and on and on and on. Now there's a significance to it. I will say that this at least builds up that there's a tension between Magneto, Xavier, and Moira and how they've talked about how their goals have sort of separated, but you could tell how salty Moira is. She's like, you guys don't listen to me anymore. And then you find out um, that Moira doesn't really have any, f uh, like they're saying, they're saying you're free to come and go as you want. You're the most important person in the world because of her knowledge. And they did something to her that even just escalates it. But what Moira finally says in order to kind of calm down this irritations that the three of them have together, she says, I want you to completely wipe out any remnant that we have backed up of destiny. And so that's where we get into thinking, okay, this is going to start getting interesting. We go to um, Magneto's volcanic island that we saw in House of X. And if you guys remember, for those of you that have been reading, there are backups of Cerebro, of the Cerebro helm on different locations in case one is compromised, as it was in Benjamin Percy's X-Force, which if you've not been reading at least the beginning of Percy's X-Force run, phenomenal. But uh, Xavier gets shot in the head, so the uh, helmet on Krakoa gets destroyed, but they have backup helms to resurrect Xavier. But you start to see Xavier and all of them start to collect all the helmets. You see Magneto approach 
Sinister to collect Destiny's DNA vials. And Moira being salty, even though mutants are supposed to have amnesty once they set foot on Krakoan uh, soil, as we saw with Omega Red in the Wolverine run, and even though um, Sabretooth gets put into suspended animation for his crimes that he does in America, he's still delivered from that court system to be judged at the Quiet Council. So it's kind of hard to see that Moira is still holding this resentment for something that happened in another life. But that's kind of what really is lighting the powder keg, as we saw in X-Men 20, where Xavier and Magneto told uh, Raven, Mystique, to go to the Orcish island to try to take or the planet orbiting thing <laughs> to wipe out Nimrod. She fails. And so the way that they've been holding the carrot over her head is saying, if you do this, if you do that, we'll resurrect destiny. So they've been kind of tempting fate and again, going against Moira's wishes. I'm kind of glad that we finally get to see a little bit more with her because she's been sort of shrouded in this um, mister, mis mystiqueness, so to speak. <laughs> um, but I hate that now that we see her, she just comes off as this major bitch. So I don't know if her intentions for Krakoa are supposed to be good or if she's starting to change her mind. Who knows? And then we get some more talking with Doug Ramsey, more talking with Krakoa, more talking with Cyclops and Bishop and Storm. And then we get to the Quiet Council, which leads to more sitting and talking. Now, the other thing that Moira proposes is to get Raven off the Quiet Council because they said, She's like, you know that I hate her and Destiny of the Purple Passion, and yet you put her in a place of authority. And so they said, find some way to get her off the council. So what I was talking about with talking in Cyclops is Cyclops talks about how he needs to step down as basically the general or the general at arms or men at arms of Krakoa, if you know if he's gonna be out in the field. So they give it to Bishop. And so Magneto and um, Xavier use that is the Quiet Council saying, we should maybe take a, uh, a page from our warriors and start saying that some of us need to retire. And they're trying to say it's voluntary, like Magneto even low-key tries to say, oh, I've thought about it. And you can just see the, um, what do you call it? The sarcasm or the deceitfulness in his voice. And then Raven says something like to the degree of, yeah, you know, the change is a very good idea. And I like how Cyclops, like, or not Cyclops, Xavier's like, you have no idea how much it pleases me to hear you say that, Raven. And she's like, I know a mutant who uh, you should consider for the council. And like, what? There'll be time for, no, the time is now. Now, I don't want to spoil how the book ends, but I just, <laughs> I really had high hopes, especially considering the fact when you pick up the book, as I said a couple of reviews ago, where the cover should really echo what the book's about. Seeing Moira stand amongst all these knocked out or presumably dead X-Men has nothing to do with what we read about. Again, this thick book, six bucks for talking. This is your last hurrah, man. Suck people in. Like maybe halfway, you know, like the stuff between Moira and the Quiet Council, that should be like the first half of the book. And then the rest of it, I, I would say the, the way to get people into it is turn Krakoa upside down. But instead we just get a lot of building, building building. Now I understand pacing and a little bit of slowness, but when you have first issue of your event book at six dollars and it's talking, 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 talking. Good God, how much talking do we need? <laughs> Seriously. And then you're thinking, okay, you know, um, we're going to start focusing on Inferno. This is awesome. But then it's like, oh, now you need to go read Sword number eight and Wolverine number 16. Ah, uh, no, no, I'm good. 
I'll wait till issue two of this. And I bet you 10 1, and I hope I'm wrong, is that this is going to probably pull the same shit that Death Metal did. My biggest gripe with Dark Knight's Death Metal was is all the big stuff didn't happen in the event book. Everything happened in the spinoff books. So I have this real funny feeling that, you know, okay, we get this interesting reveal at the end of this book. And you're thinking, okay, is that going to continue on in Inferno number two, or do we got to pick up sword number eight to see what happens next, which I'm not going to do. I'll stick with this, and I hope, I hope to my stars and garters that I'm wrong. But it's just seeming that people don't know how to do events anymore. And I'm like sitting and talking and making all your big stuff happen in other books to lessen the impact of your event book. That's not how you comic. That's not how you event. But that's just my personal opinion. What do you guys think? If you've enjoyed this comic, please, first and foremost, support your local comic shop and pick up a copy. If you've enjoyed this review, we really would appreciate it if you take a moment to hit like, share, and subscribe. Helps the club channel more than you could possibly know. And if you won't mind hitting that fancy little X bell next to subscribe, that way as we can continue to upload content, you guys get notified, come to the channel, and we love talking with you all and hearing your thoughts and feedback down in the comments below or our social media pages, which I'll make sure to leave the links down in the description. So with all that said, thank you so much for stopping by. Hope you all continue to have an absolutely amazing day reading and happy hunting, true believers.